thank you for having me. Um, it's really wonderful to hear about all the uh, things that this club does. I was unaware. I belong to the Master Gardener Association, which is a much smaller group than yours. It's about 160 volunteers on Cape Cod. And our job, when we volunteer, and it does become a job, is to uh, spend a year getting trained in the science-based horticulture and then to help the population of Barnstable County with their growing needs. So we teach courses, we have a children's garden, and we also have a hotline and I can give you the number later because if you have a plant question or a plant problem, you can email or call us and we will pretend we have the answer. <laughs> so um, I'm delighted to be here on Mass. So this winter, I read in a column in the Boston Globe by Carol Stalker, who's a pretty great gardener in the western part of the state. And one of the things that she said is that during quarantine, people began to see their gardeners as a bridge to the natural world instead of an outdoor decorating activity. So I kind of took that to heart because today we're going to focus on that. And we're not going to talk about the weatherproof furniture, the umbrella pillows, and the portable pizza ovens that we all put on our decks over the last few months. Um, and fortunately for us, the Cape has lots of native plants, but unfortunately it also has invasive plants. So you really can't talk about native plants unless you talk about invasive plants. But that's like if you were young in my house, your father gave you cod liver oil. To, and it was great. It warded off the colds, but it tasted terrible. And that's kind of how my feeling on native plants. But you're on, on basic plants, but you'll be hearing about them this afternoon. So as gardeners, most of us know innately that native plants are good for our gardens. And we also innately know that invasive plants are not. But if if you learn nothing else this afternoon, I hope that you will learn to plant more native plants in your gardens and to get rid of any invasive plants that you have. And so, why is this important? What you do in your garden matters. Our actions as gardeners have far-reaching consequences. And residential landscapes make a valuable contribution to preserving the Earth's balance, especially at a time when the balance of the ecology and ecosystems and the biodiversity, all those big words, on Cape Cod are, are in jeopardy. There are a lot of us with gardens and lawns. And we may look at our garden as our individual space, but actually they all interact together to impact the place we live. So I'm going to be showing you some native plants. This is echinacea, a coneflower. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. So gardens are more than just another pretty face in the landscape. They play a variety of roles that make our gardens alive and livable. And besides being beautiful, they screen and define spaces. They provide cooling, groundwater recharge, and food and shelter for birds, animals, and insects. This is Clethera anifolia, also known as sweet pepper bush, another native plant. So what makes a plant native? The definition is actually rather simple. It's a plant that was growing here 
prior to European settlement. Oh, that's better, thank you. So prior to European settlement in horticulture wor world is the year 1500. So a native plant was here to greet, not the Vikings, but people who came afterwards. And they are plants that are unique to a particular habitat. So that's why I call this the right plant in the right place. And using plants native to Cape Cod gives our gardens a sense of place, a distinction that separates us from other places. Native plants have evolved in, the, in harmony with the Cape's weather systems, with the soils. So once established, they require less water and less care, and they have a high survival rate. And they are the basis of the food chain. If you love pollinators in your gardens, or birds in your gardens, or if you're one of those people who really love chipmunks, that <laughs> native plants are what they live on. And this is winterberry. So if our gardens are truly a reflection of nature, they must provide a refuge for wildlife. And they must eliminate the need we have in other parts of our gardens for artificial fer synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that don't help the birds and the, the bees very much. This is one of my favorites. I'm, I'm juggling. I need a third hand. Um, so Carolina allspice, also known as sweet shrub, is a fabulous shrub and very beautiful. It's starting to come into bloom this kind of year. So plants like this have adapted to the Cape soil. So whether you have sand, in your yard or clay in your yard as certain parts of the Cape have, all of these plants will grow. But where do you find information and guidance on how to plant native plants in your gardens? I'm going to introduce you to a garden designer who uses a lot of native plants in his designs. So that they're once, his gardens are good for the environment, but they're also pleasing to the eye. And hopefully we can apply this to our gardens on Cape Cod. So first, think about what a perfect garden would look like. Does anybody have any ideas what their perfect garden would look like? I never have to do anything to it. Right. No work like that. Did I hear something out here? What would your perfect garden look like? Color all the time. So let's say four season interest. Anybody else have any feelings about what they should see in their perfect garden? Birds. Birds, yes, thank you. So a perfect garden should really be sustainable. And that's kind of a fancy word that says it shouldn't only not, this is a double negative, not harm the environment, but it should actually improve it. Especially in a place like Cape Cod, where gardens can help manage water and serve as filtration when we drink from a sole source aquifer. So whatever you put in your gardens could, could end up in your glass. And a perfect garden is one that supports biodiversity. So it provides food and shelter for birds and insects and small animals. And a perfect garden should be able to stand multiple stresses. So we had a horrible drought last summer. And sometimes we have freezes when we don't want freezes, hopefully not before Memorial Day. So uh, the climate is changing, and it's changing our behavior, and our plants are way ahead of us. 
And a perfect garden could reduce the amount of lawn that you have. This could be a very unpopular conversation with a lot of people who like grass. But too much lawn is too hard to care for and usually requires the use of herbicides and pesticides and a lot of fertilizers, which once again aren't great for the aquifer. And a perfect garden has four season interests, so it looks great all year round. And maybe most importantly, a perfect garden has a sense of identity of the gardener. And it reflects the place where the garden is planted. So gardening has, <laughs> gardening has traditionally been about exerting order over nature. So who among us have not dreamed when we go through our catalogs in March of buying a garden in the box? It may or may not come out this way, but it would be it's great to think of. We can cover we can cover spectacularly planted blooms, colorful, lovely, unusual of ornamental plants. Sometimes having a single cultivar, very, very enticing. And we kind of wish that it would come out looking like this. So all of that comes with a very stiff price, and not to mention the army it takes to maintain it. So when plants are bred for consistency, and these are mostly annuals, when they're spread for con bred for consistency, they can overspread their neighbors or they can die back in large numbers at the same time. That's not really pretty. So we are constantly investing our time in renovating and changing beautiful gardens like this. But even if we don't, a 10-year-old perennial bed a 10-year-old perennial bed, which is really the average lifetime of a perennial bed, changes over time. And it never looks like it's newly planted itself. So Pete Udolf, has anyone ever heard of him? He's a Dutch plantsman, garden designer. That's P-I-E-T, O-U-D-O-L-F, Pete Udolf. So Pete Udolf has fashioned a technique, which is actually a philosophy that questions why we fight nature when we plant our gardens, when a garden that replicates how plants grow naturally can be more beautiful, restful, capture sustainability, biodiversity, manage water, reduce the amount of lawn, look great in four seasons, and maybe even increase the uh, human interaction with the gardener. So, Udolf, Udolf and designers like him are shifting away from that concept of taming the landscape and away from our insistence on instilling order on everything we plant. His gardens have color but a lot of them are muted. And he relies on leaves and texture, shape, in order to present um, the overall picture of his gardens. So years ago, and I think where our traditional gardens have evolved from, a garden designer, Gertrude Jekyll, you've probably heard her name, revolutionized planting. And she planted beds in large swaths of a single plant. And what that did on the estates that she worked on was to hide the flaws, to hide the, pl the plants that were dying, to hide the weeds. And that was all great, except most of them were the same plant. And for the same reason that um, I mentioned they could all die back at the same time and they're very, very difficult to maintain. Udolf took that concept in a whole different direction. 
and he uses plants that perform at a different time of year that are tightly packed to the point where weeds don't grow and so tightly plant, packed that you don't even see um, soil between the plants. Hence, there's, there's not that usual uh, spring mulching job that we all have to do. So the challenge is to uh, create an enhanced nature which supports a, a level of bi biodiversity and looks a little bit wild without actually being wild. So working on the premise that the further away from nature your planting is, the more work it is for you to maintain it. And Udolf understands that we're much more relaxed in nature and his designs are intended to free us to appreciate the beauty of nature's apparent untidiness. <coughs> and because they are living things, gardens change as they, they age. I can relate to that. <laughs> and this change should be appreciated. So Udolf has done a number of public projects it, throughout the United States, but this one you might be familiar, familiar with. This is the High Line in New York City. So there was an elevated railroad track that was <coughs> built in 1930 and abandoned by Con Conrail in 1960. It was an eyesore in the neighborhood. The tracks were unused, weeds were growing, it darkened every, the retail space and the apartments that were underneath it. The neighborhood worked for years with the city to try to raise the money to knock it down. When the city of New York came up with those funds, the neighborhood changed its mind and decided that they had, gone, they had gotten quite used to their friendly raised abandoned railroad track. And they commissioned a bunch of landscape designers, Udolf among them, to create it into, to just transform the whole thing into a people friendly park. What Udolf did was he took a look at the weeds that grew up through the railroad tracks and incorporated them into his design. Not the actual weeds, but plants that kind of look like weeds. So what he has, it encompasses all the components of a perfect garden. It's sustainable, it supports birds and insects in New York City. Its plants survive multiple stresses it reduces mowing and pruning. It requires less water, because it's kind of hard to get water up there. It has four season interest, and it reflects the place where it's planted. So how do we get this effect in our own gardens without hiring the Udolf? And on Cape Cod, no less, where the average garden size is 50,000 square feet, according to the Cape Cod Commission. And how can we take the best of Udolf's philosophy and kind of transform it into our own style without totally giving up our picket fences, our roses, and our hydrangeas? <laughs> We certainly can add elements of Udolf's design, but I think, you know, truthfully, you should steal yourself psychologically. You should retrain yourself. You should give up your biases as what a perfect Cape Cod garden looks like. And you'll be moving from absolute control over what you plant to one of negotiating with nature. Your garden will go from ordered to spontaneous, at least in appearance. So a naturally appearing garden requires a lot of planning. So get out the graph paper and the colored pencils and start drawing in before you put one spade in the ground. So what Udolf is looking here, and I want to emphasize this, he's looking at a community of plants, 
not a garden of individual plants. So all of these plants depend on one another for their best look and their ability to grow. He uses a far more dense planting scheme than you or I would probably consider. And here he is implementing this plan. And if you notice, all of his pots have very small plants because he believes in order for plants to grow well in their community, they have to start out small. He also follows what he calls the 70-30 rule. So 70% of the plants that he gardens are background plants. They're very soft. They have no color. They're mostly grasses. And 30% of the plants are things that pop, things that have flowers, things that have color. In fact, the only way I can describe it is something I heard him say, which is, think of a fruitcake, if you want to. Uh, it has a, a, a very benign batter that is the background, and it is studded with dried fruits. Well, those would be the show plants that he puts in his gardens. And so some that grow well on the cake are things like salvia and hosta and asters and echinacea. You can find enough native plants that bloom at different times of year so that you always have color. Here is what that planting plan looks like. So it looks wild, but as you can see from all the planning that he did, it is not wild. He calls what he does matrix planting. And within the matrix, visual treats can bloom at different times in the different years. He also tells us to plant in layers, which we do. So, so we've all been taught smaller, shorter plants in front, gradually the larger types, larger plants in back. And you pick the colors you like. There are a variety of colors out there. If they're not true natives, there are cultivars of natives like heuchera. There is a heuchera in every spectrum of the rainbow, if you like heuchera. He also suggests that we learn to love brown because plants look great in the winter, in the frost, um, if we ever have frost. <laughs> so, simply put, in order to get more natives into your garden using the Udall far formula is you widen your borders to create more depth. You sacrifice a little bit of lawn. Plant in threes like we're told? No, he plants in thirties. Select those four or five plants that you think look well together, arrange them, and then repeat. Mix grasses with the native blooming perennials. And if you have some space, you could toss in some wildflower seed. Remember that 70-30 rule and the whole fruitcake thing. And you can intersperse some of these grassy areas with native shrubs. You could use oak leaf hydrangeas and sweet pepper bush or sweet shrub. And if there's not enough room in your garden, there are dwarf cultivars of all of those things. So select plants that look well. Can't give up those hydrangeas? Go for an arborescence or a paniculata such as little lime or bobo, or the cursifolias, the oak leaves, like Alice or the dwarf ruby slippers. These hydrangeas bloom faithfully for us in our climate. And you save those macrophyllas, those big leaf mop heads, for the sheltered area around your house where you can baby them and give them water, and knit them little sweaters to keep them from the cold. <laughs> 
So the question is, does this mean we should pull up our hydrangeas? <laughs> I, hear, I hear no. Especially after the Chamber of Commerce has worked so hard to convince us that they're Cape Cod special plant. Of course not, but think of it this way. The pretty faces of ornamental plants like hydrangeas brighten and lighten our gardens. But something has to do the heavy lifting of the ecology. And this is the essential work that native plants do. So just so you won't think that I'm just another slacker, this is my house, 1794 Cape and Sandwich. As you can see, I don't pay much attention to my front yard. The entire living space of our house stretches into the back. So when we moved here in the year 2000, I transplanted some beautiful daylilies that I had bought at Tranquil Lakes Nurseries, if any of you know that, in Rehoboth. And I put to the left of the door a little oval garden full of daylilies. And they took hold and they loved it there. And they thrived there. And they bloomed there. And I never saw them because I don't look out front. And then they invited some really noxious weeds to live in that bed with them. And it looked pretty scraggly. And I got scared because my daughter was getting wet, married in the yard in the front of the house. It wasn't up to wedding standards. So I decided to experiment with an Udolf garden on a much smaller scale. So we widened that oval, that oval bed, and we dug out those daylilies, and we planted them somewhere where I actually could see them when they bloom. And we dug out all of those weeds, and I picked as a focal point a weeping red bud. So a red bud is a native tree. A weeping red bud is a cultivar. What does that mean? Uh, it's a, what does it mean, Jane wanted to know. Thanks, Jane. Um, so a, a cultivar would be, a, how can I put this? It's a distant cousin of the native plant. It, it is a native plant, but it is bred to be just a little bit different. So in nature, this plant does not weep. So that's why it's a cultivar. But I did select it because I love the shade of the leaves. In the spring, it has these pink flowers that are beautiful. And in the fall, the leaves are really red. Plus, it's fairly close to the house, and it's not going to get very tall. So by the end of that summer, here's the weeping red bud. Its leaves are red. I have planted my little grasses. I didn't want two or three foot tall grasses, so I picked things like Pennsylvania sedge, things that are actually native. And I put some very interesting red coreopsis in between them. Well, now here's the sad story, and I don't want you to judge me. <laughs> The Coreopsis died after the first winter. The Pennsylvania sedge was a really bad choice on my part because it grows in mounds. It doesn't spread. So where I didn't want to see any mulch and I didn't want anything else to grow among the grasses and the plants that I deliberately put there, I was having a weed infestation. But you'll be happy to know that I am working on it now. It's only taken three years. And it, it is getting planted the way Udolf wants me to plant it. This is a safe space. <laughs> That's right. And I thank you all for keeping that in confidence. And, and yeah, Mashpee Public Television, 
You don't know who I am. Okay. So, before we go on, we're going to talk about invasive plants. This is also in front of my house. And this is a winged euonymus, or a burning bush, that it's okay, we're in a safe space. As Mark says, you can admit that you really like this. It is incredibly invasive. But before we go on, let's have a little quiz. So Diane can decide if you're going to get graded. I'm going to ask you what this is, and is it native or invasive? Mark's got the answer. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Mark has it. It's invasive, did I hear? I think so. And what is it? Do you know? It's not the burning bush, no. Does anyone else want to venture a guess? Clothes? So what this is, is your favorite poison ivy. And it is very native. It is a very much of a native plant. And you know, it just proves that some native plants are very naughty. What do you think this is? And yes, I took them up close so you couldn't guess. Um, no. No. Anyone else? This is a euonymus vine. It has lovely, lovely berries, and it is extremely invasive. What's this? Oh, hydrangeas, okay, that was a gimme. <laughs> this is wedding gown. It blooms white for 10 minutes. <laughs> and then becomes this lovely patina. I love it, but it wasn't what I thought when I surrounded my gazebo with them for a wedding. <laughs> What's this? It's not poison ivy, we already did that one. <laughs> did, what did I, did it, someone back there? Yes, yes, you get a gold star. This is Euonymus salatus, the burning bush, nasty bugger, and I'll show you why in a little while. So least you think, that all plants fall into two categories of native or invasive. You know that's not true. These are ornamentals, which means they came from somewhere else. Over 50% of the woody plants in the United States came from somewhere else, but they are not invasive. They may not be native, but they're not invasive. Our hydrangeas came to us from China and Japan. They are not invasive. So what is an invasive plant? And what makes a plant invasive? Why are they so bad? Why am I standing up here talking about them? They're so adaptable, they can outcompete native species and actually change the, the whole ecosystem. An example of this, and I'll show you in a while, is purple loosestrife. You can see that in bodies of water. In June, it's in full bloom. It is magnificent. It is choking out every single other plant and altering the pH or the acidity of the water, which then impacts the amphibious life. <coughs> I mean, think of the oriental bittersweet, which is so pretty in the fall, even as it's, as it's strangling your prized dogwood. So native invasive plants 
grow and mature rapidly, they spread quickly, they have few natural enemies, and they're difficult to control. Well, that kind of sounds like the perfect plant. If, as we were talking earlier, you don't want any other plants in your garden. So they reduce biodiversity by monopolizing light, nutrients, and water, and space, and keep all other plants from thriving. So here is that purple loose strife. So you can see this as you ride from Sandwich, the old exit four, um, into Hyannis. It is on the right, and in June it is in full bloom. It was brought here intentionally, probably in the 1830s. Invasive plants are not native to the region. They came from somewhere else. And then here's another big favorite of mine, the common Phragmite. Now there is a native Phragmite, but this garden thug, or more than a thug, has actually crowded that out. So how did native plants, how do, sorry, how did invasive plants get here? Birds, right? Car tires, wind. They were sold in nurseries. They were sold in nurseries, garden catalogs. They came on, they still come in on uh, garden mulch and soil that is brought in that we buy and bring to our properties. But mostly it's us. So who here, and you guys, we're in the safe place now. <laughs> who has brought a seed or a seedling? from some place you've traveled to. Come on. Oh, pass, absolutely. Pass. Yeah. Okay. You, you are, you're liars. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have, you're in good company because so did Thomas Jefferson. And Victoria era explorers were plant hunters and plant collectors. And while most of us no longer take three year sea voyages to go collect plants, we do love what's new. And so many of the plants that were collected in the Victorian era worked out well. Avocados, tomatoes, oranges, many of our street trees, those gorgeous um, cherry blossoms around the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. Those hydrangeas we love so much. But many did not work out so well. And why do we care? We care because invasive plants reduce biodiversity by, of course you remember, there's no quiz on this, monopolizing light, nutrients, and space. And they imperil wildlife by eliminating their nesting areas and changing the food that they eat and the cover for their sites. And they can degrade water quality. So, okay, how do you know what they are? Well, there is a prohibited plant list that is put out by the state of Massachusetts. And its purpose is to identify a list of plants that could harm the environment so they won't be sold and traded or imported on a commercial basis. What you do in your yard with an invasive plant is your business. It is not covered by any regulation. But one thing this prohibited plant list and its prohibition on the commercial import of invasive plants does is protect us. And I want to give you an example. Since Mark and Lois brought these beautiful impatience. So if you will remember seven, eight, nine years ago, we all bought impatience. 
this country club buys lots of impatiens and we woke up one morning and they were little skeletons. Yeah. <laughs> they came from a Florida grower with a disease called downy mildew. They're not an invasive plant, they're an annual, but this is how quickly it spread. We were all devastated by downy mildew. And we had to quickly search for other plants that grew in the shade, and we weren't familiar with too many of them, and either were our garden centers. And the downy mildew stayed in the soil for three years. It might still be there, but as you can see, we've recovered from it. But that cost the state and the taxpayers, meaning us, lots of money. So that's just an example of why the state wants to prohibit commercially the, Im the importation of invasive plants. So what are some of the usual suspects that you have in your yard? Well, one of the Cape's most iconic trees is the black locust. The black locust is actually native to Pennsylvania, but it is considered invasive in Massachusetts and especially on the Cape because if you have any in your yard, you might notice that their shallow root systems really travel and their nasty little thorned seedlings pop up everywhere. The bees do like the flowers, but they're not discriminating anyway because they're not native either. <laughs> so Japanese knotweed. I hear this is delicious with strawberries. So this actually came here deliberately in the Victorian era in the 19th century as an ornamental. You could buy it in a garden catalog and you would plant it to hold the bankings if on a stream or to provide a privacy fence. And it has a pretty intriguing uh, structure. Just try to get rid of it. it. It spreads so quickly by rhizomes underground and by seeds that you can see it in any woodland on Cape Cod just taking over. So nothing, nothing else grows. It's called, called a monoculture infestation. I just like the sound of that word. But it really can take over and it is very, very difficult to get rid of. So then we have my favorite, the burning bush. So the burning bush you see all over the Cape, and we do have lots and lots of it, and why is it so bad? It spreads if left unchecked. Well, the one you saw in my yard, I think I check it by mowing under it and getting rid of the seedlings and pulling up the stray seedlings that are in my cultivated gardens. But I have a lot of scrub brush on my land, and it is loaded with winged euonymus. It is deep-rooted and very difficult to get out. And I'll show you the one I hate the most. This is Japanese barberry. Now, you might be familiar with this because a lot of contractors tend to put this as a foundation planting. It is so nasty, maybe they felt people wouldn't go through it to look in your windows, I'm not sure. <laughs> On the right is a picture of some land that my husband and I own. It's a little scraggly oak forest. It is totally unusable. The Japanese Barbary has taken over the understory of the trees. You can't pull it out. You can't pull it out. And so not only have we lost a use, the use of that land, it also is a harbor for things like white-footed mice. Ticks, you all know about white-footed mice as a vector for ticks and Lyme disease. So it's a double whammy on trying to get rid of Japanese barberry. Then we have bittersweet. 
So bittersweet is another one that is next to impossible to eradicate. It has, unfortunately, what we call the Martha Stewart effect. Yeah. <laughs> its capsules are so pretty in the fall, if you walk down the streets of Woods Hole, you will see them in all the window boxes. Bittersweet, Asian bittersweet, there is a native bittersweet that we never see. It is one of those that one of those horrible plants that spreads usually by birds and the wind and it will take over. You can see it crawling up a tree. I, uh, I have been a victim of um, my own stupidity with bittersweet. I hung it on my door when I first bought the house on the Cape and uh, it spread to a nearby ancient quince bush and took it over and took it over. And I've been in there, I've hired landscapers to knock it down, to poison it. It's very healthy. <laughs> so what do we do about these things? You know, it would be nice to think that we could erase them from the landscape, but that would be too optimistic. So let's talk about it. In order to get rid of an invasive plant, you need to have a plan. If you have a large area of invasive plants and you mow them all down or you manage to kill them in some fashion, some other invasive plant will take their place because nature abhors a vacuum. But you need to know what they are. You need to remove them as soon as you see them. You need to replace them immediately with something else that is not so noxious. You need to constantly be vigilant about what's in your garden, and then you need to repeat the whole process. So prevention is the number one method of keeping invasive plants to a minimum. So it's time for another quiz. <laughs> Native or invasive? So I know someone here knows the name. The name's on it. Because the name's on it. <laughs> this is what happens when you mess around with your presentation the day before. Um, it's a sea, sea thistle. It is an ornamental, it is native to the Mediterranean area, but I will tell you, if you can get your hands on some, the pollinators really, really love it. And it's, it's, it's blue. super pretty. I bought one it last is. year. It's great. Uh, and it's blue. <laughs> it's blue. Okay, this is a gimme. What's this? It's a hydrangea macrophylla. This is of the variety Let's Dance Rave. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Everybody gets an A, right? We're growing. It's a... So let me leave you with this. You know, the, the way to incorporate more native plants into your garden is give yourself time to observe. I know you've had a year of time, and you probably don't want any more to observe. But really, really look at your garden and its plants. And what small changes can you make to, to make your garden more of a perfect garden? Because if you're mindful of the impact that each of our small gardens has on the future of Cape Cod, you might find that moving to a more natural garden is, only, is not only more freeing for you as the gardener, but its benefits will reach far into your neighbors. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Do we have a short time for questions if there are any? And no, I don't hate hydrangeas. <laughs> Not a hydrangea <laughs> question. What about lamb's ear? Is that, it seems invasive, but I'm No, it, lamb's ear is called a garden thug, which is one of those, it's not invasive.
but it does spread. And so yank it out. <laughs> for growing poppies. I love poppies. So they love sandy soil. And the trouble with poppies, here's the trouble with poppies. They spread and they're absolutely magnificent. And then in June, after they bloom, they, they're ugly, they die. So you have to have something to put in its place. I just found out that Creepy Jenny oh, is now yes. invasive and I love it. I was trying to cover a garden with it. Well, go for it. Nobody's going to arrest you. Um, I have Creeping Jenny as a ground cover in one of my perennial beds, and I really like it. My husband hates it because it goes into the lawn, but I say anything green on the lawn is fine. You cannot buy it. You cannot buy it. You ask me. <laughs> Any other questions? Is it too late to start a garden now? No, it's never too late. Jane asked, is it too late to plant a garden now? You know, um, you just better water it a lot. You know, but uh, it's never too late in my book. Is it enough to amend the soil compost as opposed to using any kind of fertilizer? Or is there any kind of fertilizer you recommend over others? So the question is, what kind of fertilizer could we recommend, and is it necessary if you amend the soil with compost? So the, na the, the natural, Mary says, you don't need anything else. If your soil is good, you don't need any other fertilizer. It depends on what you're growing. If you're growing annuals that are continually blossoming, they're exhausted. Feed them something, yeah, right. and you're not going to eat them, so it doesn't matter, I hope. It doesn't matter what you feed them, but if you, the same with tomatoes. Tomatoes are annuals, and they ta it takes tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and almost any vegetable, it, they need an extra boost of fertilizer, fish emulsion, or I, I would not use a synthetic fertilizer on my vegetables because I eat them. But Mark had, I saw, he's gonna tell you because I saw that he brought some bags of very interesting um, oh, yeah. fertilizer. Yeah. Well, the thing to do is, um, instead of amending your soil and changing it all, is, is you can buy the right kind of plant that'll grow in something very sandy and be very happy. And we sell uh, all the tone products, plant tone, polytone, they have a product called Biotone. They all contain these uh, completely unpronounceable bacteria that are very beneficial to the roots. You put it right in when you're planting it, and that improves the roots in whatever it's going to grow in, so that you haven't created a, uh, an artificial environment of like it's, the soil is so good here that by the time the roots get over to where the regular soil is, it's like, oh, I don't want to grow anymore. So by, uh, by buying stuff that, that is the right thing for your house, like if you've got all sand, if you come visit me, I've got lots of stuff that will grow in sand. So, you know, we can really guide you in those kind of ways. Uh, plus, you'll find that the other stuff that you planted, that you wanted to grow, didn't grow in sand. So you'll have a place to replace it. Um, and you were right, Lois, who asked me, like, hey, I think we have every one of those plants. We had all but about two of the ones we saw <laughs> for sale. Right. So like, right. uh, like Clethra, we got all that stuff. That's right. <laughs> so big plug, go visit capabilities <laughs> if you want to buy your plants. <laughs> Thank you.